Let's talk about sleeping and waking. Uh, just about any health plan that you are engaged in is going to say something about the importance of regular sleep. And more and more we're recognizing that mental health is related to sleep disturbance. And that people who have mood disorders often have chaotic, irregular sleep patterns. Sometimes it's under their control and sometimes it's not. One of the very first things we do is work with people on what is their sleep-wake sleep -wake routine. And it turns out it's not so important what time you go to bed. It's that it's the same time every night and that you get enough hours of sleep. So it's not particularly important whether you go to bed at 11 and wake up at 7 or if you go to bed at 1 and wake up at 9. Some people do better with those uh, arrangements. But it is important not to be going to bed at 10 and then 2 and then 1 and then 3. Uh, my daughter, when she was a teenager, used to uh, uh, sleep with her cell phone underneath her pillow. And she'd get texted and called by her friends in the middle of the night who were also up all night. And believe me, it had an effect on her mood. It does for most people. Uh, we encourage people not to sleep binge on weekends because it tends to throw off sleep during the week, even though it's tempting to sleep in on Saturday or Sunday, uh, to try to avoid sleeping in two, three, four hours and getting up at noon when you have to get up at six the next day. Lots of over-the-counter medications are secretly going to keep you up at night. Sudafed is the most famous one, but certainly coffee, jolt, colas, and so forth, anything with lots of sugar in it. Uh, people sometimes do their workout routines right before they go to bed when, in fact, exercise keeps you up. So we ask people to move their exercise routine earlier. When you're traveling, you try to keep a normal sleep wake routines. If you're a person who needs to travel a lot for your work, you have to try to get back on a regular routine as quickly as possible. This is one of the things that people can track on a daily basis. How is my mood? How is my sleep? How much are the two of them interfering with each other? Okay, let's talk about medications for a moment. This is often the most emotional topic for people is taking medications and which ones. This is only a partial list of what medications we have for bipolar disorder. The plus signs indicate whether that drug has been found by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, to be effective for mania, for mixed episodes, which are episodes where people are high and low at the same time, depressed episodes, and what we call maintenance treatment. Do they prevent recurrences in people who are well? One of the things we know about lithium is that not only does it bring people down from highs and to some extent people bring people up from lows, it also prevents the occurrence of future episodes in people who are vulnerable. Lithium has the best uh, evidence, but that's because it's been around the longest. We also have lamotrigine or lamictal, which seems to be better for, for depression, and we often use it as a, uh, an antidepressant. We have all the Atypical antipsychotics like quetiapine or uh, better known as Seroquel or Abilify or Zyprexa or Risperdal, those do have a pretty good effect on mania and sometimes on depression. Uh, the problem with all of them, of course, is they cause weight gain, Zyprexa being the worst of all those. But they can be adjusted, dosages can be adjusted, one can be substituted for another. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I will tell you that the issue that the issue of taking medications it comes up all the time in my work in psychotherapy. People have a love-hate relationship with medications when they have bipolar disorder. On the one hand, it controls their mood, helps them function, helps them relate better to people, but at the same time, people feel like their emotions have been taken away or their creativity has been stolen from them, which are legitimate feelings to have. What I tell people, it, well first I think it's, it's a given that people are more likely to take medications if they're approached in a humanitarian way with information when they're told what it is these medications do, why you're taking two or three or four of them instead of one or two. Why am I taking an antipsychotic? I thought that was for schizophrenia. Why do I, am I taking an antidepressant? I don't feel depressed. 
All that information is sometimes withheld, and it's very important for doctors to be giving you that information to let you know that if your medications aren't working, you can have a discussion about changing them, changing the dosages, substituting one for another, taking one away. Uh, there are various ways to adjust the medication regimen. It should be an ongoing dialogue between your doctor and yourself. Many people don't know they can have that conversation. When, when people are not wanting to take medicines, I usually suspect a couple of different possibilities. One, of course, is side effects. They don't want to take their medications because it's causing weight gain or it's causing my hands to shake or it's causing me to urinate a lot or I have a, a heavy feeling or I'm tired all the time and I don't like that. Sometimes it's because they forget. They forget when they're supposed to take their morning or the evening dose. One of the simplest solutions to that is some of these medications can be taken once a day but you may not know that unless you have that discussion with your doctor. For some people, the issues have to deal with family relationships. And this particularly comes up if you have, say, an 18 or 19-year-old person with bipolar disorder who's living with his parents. Say he's dropped out of college and gone, gone back to live with his parents and is now feeling unpleasantly like a kid again. And taking medicines makes him feel like he's under his parents' thumb. So to give you an example, I had an 18-year-old kid I worked with who uh, his mother was very worried about him not taking medicine, so she would follow him around the house. Did you take your lithium today? You seem upset. When we were watching that movie the other night, you laughed off awfully loudly. You were agitated this morning. Maybe you need more lithium. He started torturing her by leaving lithium tablets all over the house. <laughs> and he would, he left them under the, uh, he left them behind the toilet, he left them on the counter, he even left them under her pillow. And uh, needless to say, you can guess what the issue is. He couldn't take the medicine if he felt he was doing it for her. He felt that this was somehow putting him in an immature position. She was rightfully worried that he wasn't taking them. They negotiated an interesting solution. I tried to help them negotiate it, and I came up with a bunch of solutions that didn't even come close to working for them. What they came up with was much better, which was that uh, She'd leave the tablets out for him. There was only four he had to take during the day. She'd leave them out on a plate. He would agree to take them during the day. He, she got access to his monthly lithium level uh, report from his doctor. And other than that, they weren't to discuss it. It was up to him to take them. And uh, that, for them, worked pretty well. And they came up with it themselves. So sometimes it's important to take it out of the context of an autonomy battle. This can also happen with spouses, uh, and sometimes it happens the other way around. So for example, you'll hear, a, a, I remember hearing a man say to his wife, his wife had, uh, uh, was taking, I think it was Zyprexa and had gained a lot of weight, and he said to her something like, you know, we used to have a great sex life. Not anymore, I guess. And this was his way of saying, I liked you better when you weren't taking medicines. Uh, a father said to his 17-year-old son, uh, you used to be such a great basketball player, now you're taking Depakote and you look like a spaz out there on the basketball court. Needless to say, he wasn't behind the medicines. And often when someone won't take them, it also reflects an ambivalence in the family as a whole. That's something therapists have to be aware of. Sometimes the issues have to do with, I'm a painter, I can't have my hand shake when I'm trying to paint or I'm trying to do very delicate work with my hands, that might require a change in medicines or a change in dosage. For other people, the issue is even deeper. Grieving the lost healthy self, we call it. Remembering how I used to be before I became ill. I used to be healthy, I used to have friends, now I'm taking medicines and everything's changed. So you can see how something like taking pills can take on a lot of symbolic significance and the family gets involved very quickly. If any of you have a teenager who's taking medicines, I can tell you that whether or not they should be in charge of the medicines really depends upon the age of the kid and the maturity level. When kids turn 16, 17, and 18, I like to encourage them to take responsibility for their medicines little by little. So filling prescriptions rather than having their parents fill it, uh, calling their doctors to change appointments, 
remembering to take the pills by setting an alarm on their cell phone. Uh, but younger kids are not able to handle it yet. They still need a parent to dole out the pills. So it's a kind of a careful negotiation one needs to do based on the cognitive functioning of the child. And you can give them too much responsibility too quickly. Let's talk about mania prevention. I mentioned the importance of knowing one's prodromal signs. What we encourage every family to do, if you have a person who has bipolar disorder, who's had manic episodes, is to develop a contract where when prodromal signs, early warning signs, first appear, the family has a set of uh, steps it takes to try to keep the person out of the hospital. And that person should be a very much a part of that contract. So if we know that when he starts talking louder, staying up later, and calling people all over the country, that's when we know he's getting manic. We know that there are certain things that we can do. We can help him get to sleep on time. We can call up the physician, get a change in medications. Uh, the person with the disorder may have very strong feelings about who is involved in that plan. Maybe mom shouldn't do it. Maybe it should be uncle, or maybe it should be brother, who they can hear this kind of thing from. There has to be an agreement. The therapist might get involved. The emergency contact information should be in a, a place where you can find it. Nowadays, it used to be that you'd have to call your physician and get them on a weekend or whatever uh, to try to get the medicine changed. Nowadays, many physicians are writing the prescriptions in advance and saying, well, if you get manic, if you have these prodromal signs, I want you to take an extra risperidol or uh, to increase your dosage of, of lithium by this amount. And that can all be worked out ahead of time, but that discussion needs to occur. There needs to be a contract about what do we do. How do we keep stress in the home and structure? How do we make sure everybody gets to, to bed on time? More practically, if this is a young adult or a teenager and they're manic or getting manic, I encourage them to take someone along with them when they go out at night. So instead of going out at night by themselves to bring a friend along or an older brother or a sibling or a cousin, someone who's going to watch over and make sure they don't make foolish decisions. If they are having trouble with their car, uh, so I have had patients who've told me every time I get manic, something happens with my car. I get in an accident, I get arrested, I get a re reckless driving charge, I get a drunk driving charge. Can they give up the car keys until they're stable? They won't want to but they may agree to it ahead of time. We tell them about the 48-hour rule. If you have a plan you've hatched for changing your life, I'm going to move to California and become a rock musician. I'm going to go to uh, Congress and tell them how to handle the, the budget deficit. Uh, any of those things, we tell them, wait 48, 48 hours and check it out with two people you trust. See if they think it's a good idea. If it's a good idea now, it'll be a good idea on Thursday as well. Try to build in some uh, uh, delay of gratification, as we're fond of, of calling it when someone is getting manic. Uh, communication. This is a picture that was given to me by the parent of a 16-year-old. Uh, I had asked her, what's it like to have a 16-year-old with bipolar disorder? She said, well, here it is. That's me on a string. My son is like a big baby puppeteer, keeping us all on a string with his vicious mood swings. Worst of all, he seems delighted that he can do it. Many parents feel very disempowered. They feel like, particularly if it's a teenager, that their whole family has been taken over by this person's mood swings, that they can't pay attention to their other kids. The siblings feel like uh, this, is, uh, this is taking, uh, that my brother's uh, uh, nonsense is taking over the family, and the family doesn't seem to understand he's faking it, or he's getting away with murder, and nobody cares about me anymore. Parents often disagree about how it is that the person should be addressed, or how they should be talked to, or how we get him in to get a medication check. And all this, of course, depends upon good family communication. And one of the things we do in our program is spend a lot of time with families on how do you talk to each other? What's a good give and take look like? We might role play listening, for example. I'll give an example. Uh, 
Here's a handout, looks pretty elementary. This is how you listen to someone. Look at the person, attend to what they say, nod your head, ask questions, check out what you heard. Most of us wouldn't have trouble doing this on a day-to-day -day basis with, what, with our, our family members, but when someone is getting manic and they're talking over you and they're angry, slowing down and having this kind of measured interchange where you acknowledge each other's viewpoints can really bring the person down for a short period of time and help them listen to reason. Likewise, we teach people how do you make a positive request? How do you ask for things you want? I'd really like it if you went with me to see your doctor and we at least got an opinion about what's going on, about how we can help, about what's, whether your medications are working, whether they're the right ones, whether he's even the right doctor. We need to have that conversation. But there are good and bad ways to communicate that information. Doesn't mean that just because you talk nice, the person is going to go along with it. But certainly having a base of a good collaborative relationship is, I think, half the battle. Uh, the, uh, this handout, I find, is the one that many families find the most useful. How can they help? Well, they can help the person get to their doctor appointments. They can support the use of medication, which might mean helping with filling, getting refills or paying co-pays, um, maintaining a tolerant home atmosphere as much as possible. It's very hard when someone's manic and aggressive, but at least from your side, being able to keep hot flick to a minimum. Having fair expectations of the person and other family members. And very importantly, keeping regular family routines. As much as it's important for the person with the disorder to go to sleep and wake up at the same time, there should also be family rituals, especially if there's a younger person involved. When do we eat dinner? When does the TV go off? When do all the cell phones get turned off? When does the modem, if there is one, get turned off? All these things ought to be uh, made more regulated so that there's a little more structure around the person's routines. So the family, in other words, is very, very important in making all this work. What about the work situation? What can you do to make life easier for yourself at work? Uh, do you even want to tell people at work that you have bipolar disorder? And I've written a lot about this in, the, in my book, The Survival Guide, because it's one of the major questions I get. Should I be telling people at work that I have this disorder? Um, my answer to that is only tell people at work you have this disorder if there's something you want out of that disclosure. If there's something, an adjustment you want to your work hours, your work responsibilities, how you're evaluated, uh, how many breaks you take for medical visits, then I think it does make sense because you're not going to get any of those things without disclosing. But if it's just because you feel like telling any, somebody, that's not the place to do it because unfortunately people take that information and then when there's an altercation they say, well, you know, uh, Jane has bipolar disorder. I don't know if the rest of you knew that. And then of course it's out on the table. Uh, various practical things people can do, work in well-lit rooms. We know people with the disorder do better in lighted facilities. Sometimes people do better with a later start to the workday. Likewise, school kids with bipolar disorder, sometimes it's good if they can have homeroom when they go to school and not start math till 10 o'clock. Or uh, uh, somebody who's on a shift takes an afternoon shift instead of getting there at 7 in the morning. They may be on medications that make it impossible to get up early in the morning. Drugs like Adderall, for example, the stimulant for ADHD, kids report feeling extremely uh, sort of wrung out in the morning, like they can't get up even though they, they want to. This is what we call sleep inertia. They can't move and their parents are yelling at them, get up, get up, the bus is coming in a half an hour, but they honestly feel like they can't move. Sometimes kids can, sometimes you can arrange a later start to the school day for the child. Finally, oh, let me just say this about for parents of bipolar kids. Uh, if you have a kid who's in primary, secondary school, it's important, I think, if you do decide to disclose the son or daughter's disorder to the, to the school system, again, know what it is that you want out of it. Is it an 
IEP, so to speak, an edu individualized educational plan? Uh, do we want him to be going to counseling sessions during the day? Does he need more time or breaks? Do, does homework need to be broken into smaller pieces? There are various, the school is not going to do all those things, but they may make some adjustments with you if they know that he has a disorder that needs to be managed. There may need to be escape hatches, so to speak, during the day for the kid to be able to get away from uh, teachers that are stimulating to him or school situations or rejection from schoolmates. Finally, let's talk about regular therapy and support groups. I certainly recommend support groups, the Depressive and Bipolar Support Alliance, high on my list, NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness, various support groups, uh, AFSP, American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, uh, have support groups for parents and for people with a disorder. I highly recommend those. Educational lectures, you end up meeting other people of the disorder or, or family members, and they often have no know of doctors or uh, other people they've seen in the community that they find helpful. If you do join a support group, I think it's important that it involve a certain amount of what we call psychoeducation, information about the disorder and how to handle it, how to cope with it emotionally and practically, rather than just say an encounter, express your emotions type of, of group, which I think tends to be less helpful. Uh, if you decide to go the individual therapy route and you have bipolar disorder, great. But again, it should involve a certain amount of discussion of coping strategies, knowledge about bipolar disorder, and it should be at least weekly or biweekly. Most of the research we have suggests that regular therapy is going to be a useful adjunct to medication. So our particular approach is the one I've been talking about, family-focused therapy. We meet with families for 21 sessions. And we do 21 sessions with the patient and with the parents or spouse, very much like what we just did. We talked about how to recognize early warning signs, what the pros and cons are of adherence with medications, how to communicate effectively, how to identify problems in the school system or at work. And this treatment, sometimes it goes on for a while, but when it does, we find that the outcomes of the disorder are much better than if the person just took medications. So here's an example. This is the so-called STEP bipolar program. Um, there's a lot of information up here, but let me summarize it in a sentence or two. We compared three different kinds of therapy to people who just got medication and a couple of sessions of, of counseling. These people got about 15 sessions of therapy, the more intensive therapy group. And those who got regular therapy in addition to their medications got over depression an average of 110 days more rapidly if they got therapy than if they were only getting medication and brief counseling. So getting therapy actually sped up the time before the person recovered from their depressive episodes. And we have, this is only one study, and we have many other studies that suggest this. And this was both individual and family forms of therapy. So I'm going to end just like I started with a quote from Kay Jameson, uh, who says this about psychotherapy. I cannot imagine leading a normal life without both taking lithium and having had the benefits of psychotherapy. Ineffably, psychotherapy heals. It makes some sense of the confusion, reigns in the terrifying thoughts and feelings, returns some control and hope and possibility of learning from it all. It is where I have believed or have learned to believe that I might someday be able to contend with all of this. Thank you. A little bit of shameless self-advertising here. 